the key to winning in today's environment is to be in hard assets that have intrinsic value, where you have an effective hedge against inflation, lever it responsibly with debt. It's not complicated. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's not complicated. It doesn't have to be real estate itself. It can be other hard assets. I'm a big proponent of investing in gold. I actually like to hold the metal itself because there's no counterparty. Welcome to another exciting episode of the podcast, The Thought Leader Revolution. I'm your host, Nikki Ballou. Boy, do we have an awesome guest lined up for you today. Today's guest is a repeat guest. This is his fourth time on the show. He's a dear friend of mine. He's a former client of mine. And this man is one of the leading thought leaders in the world of real estate, real estate investing, raising capital for funding projects. He is absolutely incredible at it. He is the best-selling author of the book, Magnetic Capital, and he has his own podcast with millions upon millions of downloads. I am speaking, of course, of none other than the one the only, the legendary Victor Manash. Welcome to the show, Victor. Great to be here, Nikki. Awesome, my man. So, Victor, it's been a while since we've had you on the show. Things have changed in the world a little bit, and I thought it would be a good time to have you back on to comment on the state of the world, comment on the state of investing, and comment on what people can do to thrive in inflationary times. So before we get into that, why don't you, just for the benefit of the people who are new to the show, give us a brief background of who you are and how you got to be the great Victor Menashe. Well, thank you, Nikki. It's a pleasure to be here. And my journey into the world of real estate investing and real estate development, is definitely not the typical journey by any means. I started my career as a microprocessor designer back in the 1980s, designing chips for telecom applications. 52% uh, of the phone calls in North America were routed by a chip that I designed for over a decade. And I've got chips in all kinds of different applications, seatback displays on Airbus aircraft and Pachinko patchy slot machines in Japan with Sammy Sega and NVIDIA and all kinds of weird and wonderful applications. They even have a chip in the Patriot missile, uh, which is unfortunately seeing a little bit more use these days. Wow. But uh, yeah. So it's a, it, it was a very interesting tech career. Learned how to raise money in the tech industry. And, and it was really, it, by learning that process, you know, one of the hardest things to do is to raise money for just an idea. If you have a legitimate business, if you have a business with proven comps and a demonstrable path to revenue, that's much, much easier. But in the world of technology, you're raising money for an idea. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that it's a lot easier to raise $300 million for an existing business than it is to raise even $5 million for just an idea. And about 2009, I transitioned out of the world of technology. I was on my 18th trip to Tokyo in about a year and a half, building a new cellular network with a number four carrier in Japan at the time and decided to just resign my position as VP of engineering and to do something completely different, it, literally to move into the world of real estate investing and development on a full-time basis. So literally took my high six-figure income and took it to zero overnight. Fortunately, the company hired me back as a consultant three days a week for the same pay, which freed up some time and extended my financial runway. And if you remember right around 2009, something kind of interesting was happening in the world of real estate. Not if you were holding real estate at that time, because you were playing defense, but if you were playing offense, that was an amazing time to be entering the market. The key, of course, was to make sure that you were, in fact, buying a bargain and not catching a falling knife, as the phrase used to be at the time. <laughs> and, you know, we were entering what turned out to be a decade that really, for all intents and purposes, was the opportunity of a lifetime. If I was to go back and do it again, I would have capitalized on it far more than I did, but I was just learning. And I had to relearn, I had to relearn, I had to learn real estate, I had to relearn how to raise capital all over again. And when I did discover that it was exactly the same as it was in the tech industry with a few little nuances, but basically the same process. So that, that was my journey into the world of investing. And today we're developing apartments, senior housing, self-storage, uh, condos. We have about 600 units of vertical construction in our current pipeline and about 2,000 acres of land development, a lot of that residential and multifamily subdivisions. That's pretty amazing. So that's my journey. It's a great journey. It's pretty amazing what you've done. 
And um, a few years ago, you and I connected. We were both at a conference being put on by uh, the great Raymond Aaron. You had uh, your new book out, which was, uh, the, I think it was called The Great Canadian Takeover. Was it the great? Yes, that's right. Yeah. And so you were talking about Canadians that's buying US real estate. And I just put a book out then. It was called Finish Line Thinking, How to Think and Win Like a Champion. And um, you and I began working together for a little while. I, I, I coached you and I got you involved in the world of thought leadership. And then you wrote another book called Magnetic Capital and, and you launched a podcast. Let's talk a little bit about that aspect of your journey. How did that help you get from you know, where you were to where you are right now? Because you made a quantum leap forward in terms of the types of deals you were doing and in terms of the type of uh, income you were bringing in for yourself. I think the any business requires an investment in multiple different facets. A lot of people tend to focus operationally, uh, which is absolutely essential. You got to focus on execution, uh, but you also need to focus a certain percentage of both time and money into what the world calls marketing. But most people don't actually even know what that means. To me, that means investing in generating interest. Sales is the process of generating revenue. Marketing is the process of generating interest. So how do you put yourself out there so that when, so that you go up that ladder of what's called brand equity? We are at the very base of that ladder. Either people have heard of you or they haven't. That's just, that's called brand recognition. The next level up from that is brand preference. I'd like a Coke. Sorry, we don't have Coke. We only have a Pepsi. Okay, I'll have a Pepsi. That's, that's brand preference. And then you go up from there to brand insistence, where you might say, I'd like a Coke, please. And you say, sorry, I have Pepsi. And they say, well, forget it, I'll have water. That's brand insistence. And then you get to the, the, the top level, the ultimate level, where people talk about um, brand advocacy. And brand advocacy is when people who don't work for you refer to you, shout from the mountaintops how great you are. Companies like Apple, Apple has brand advocacy. Uh, uh, Tesla has brand advocacy. You should do. Where people who don't work for Tesla talk, sing its praises. So you want to move up that ladder. And, but it starts, you have to start with brand recognition. You can't skip steps on that ladder. So how do you get known? Uh, it's, in fact, by putting yourself out there. How do you put yourself out there in a way that's not this narcissistic TikTok look at me thing? which is interesting if you're putting out cat <laughs> videos, but if you're looking to generate revenue is not that interesting. So you've got to deliver something that works in today's environment because people don't want to be sold. They're, you know, interruption marketing just doesn't work anymore, but educational marketing does. So what I've invested in from the very beginning is the notion that people are willing to be educated. They don't want to be sold. They don't want to be hustled. They don't want any of that yucky stuff, but they are willing to be educated. So I put out educational content. And that's what I do on the podcast, the Real Estate Espresso podcast, a daily show seven days a week. Like you said, the show's doing well. And we have a very loyal uh, listener, uh, listener base of sophisticated investors, not the rookie audience. These are folks, many of whom own thousands of units of apartments. We have very, very high quality listeners. And that starts to build a bit of a community. And so that was really the whole thought process, very intentional, very deliberate in terms of how to start to build that community without it feeling, uh, you know, like a, it's not a cult <laughs> and it's not, and it's not a sales funnel. It's simply generating a bit of a following uh, where, you know, you generate interest through educational marketing. That's, the, that's, that's it. Generate interest through educational marketing. So that's very true and very powerful. And what you did in that process is you started to really talk about your genuine expertise. So for example, one of the things that you're pretty amazing at is raising capital. You were good at it when you were in the tech world, you've become masterful at it in the real estate world. And yet a lot of people didn't know that about you. A lot of people knew you as a developer. A lot of people knew you as a fellow who could help them buy some property, but they didn't know that you were this man who understood how to create a magnetic attraction capital. So when you started to put that level of your expertise out there, that got you a lot of notoriety, that got you a ton of brand recognition. So you started to get on shows, 
Other people wanted you uh, on their podcasts, on their TV shows, on their radio shows. And you started to be asked to come and speak at conferences, which also really gave you a leg up in terms of being able to attract that type of community that you wanted to attract. Maybe spend a couple moments about that, about how important it is to really discover what your real expertise is and to speak about that in a way that isn't salesy. Well, I think before you even do that, you got to figure out who your target client is. Um, who is it that you actually want to speak to and what is it that's going to be meaningful to them? You know, a lot of people uh, suffer what's called imposter syndrome where they say, well, I am not the expert. Uh, you know, there's people that are maybe have a higher level of expertise and, and it doesn't matter what field you're in, that's always going to be true. If you're, if you're a doctor, there's a neurosurgeon that knows more than you do. If you're, you know, it doesn't matter what the subject is, there's always someone that knows more. But guess what? They're not necessarily your audience. You got to figure out who your audience is and what's going to be meaningful to them. So in my case, my audience are folks that have achieved a certain level of success in real estate investing and maybe a little bit of development. Maybe they've got 30 units in their portfolio or 50 units in their portfolio and they want to get to 500, but they don't know how. That's my avatar. That's who I speak to. I'm not interested in talking to someone who's just read a book or taken a weekend workshop and has Steve's sees, you know, has stars in their eyes and, you know, they're going to retire a billionaire, but they have no idea how to get there. That's not, that's not my target client. Someone who's achieved a certain measure of success or someone who's made, had success in business, sold a business. They've worked hard for their money. They want to put their money to work. They don't want to have to go make it all over again. Although they know they could, if they have to, they don't want to, they simply want to protect their capital and make sure that it's going to be invested in the safe way with good stewards in projects that are going to give them a solid hedge against inflation, a good risk reward profile. And that's, that's who we speak to. Yeah. Understanding who your ideal client is, is very important. Understanding what your expertise is and how it can help them is very important. And then putting yourself out there. And I love the four step ladder that you outlined for us from brand recognition all the way up to brand advocacy. That's really powerful stuff. Really, really great stuff. So Victor, let's talk a little bit about real estate and the current economic and political environment, because I'm fascinated to hear what your thoughts are. We're experiencing inflation, the likes of which we haven't seen since the Carter era in the late seventies. And we're experiencing uh, a, a level of uh, foreign policy uncertainty that again, we haven't seen since the seventies when the Russians invaded Afghanistan. <laughs> so to me, all of this is very interesting and I'd love to understand what your thoughts are and where we're at today and what we need to do to navigate it properly. So we're in an environment that is inflationary. Some would say we're on the cusp of hyperinflationary. And I learned a very interesting lesson back in those times. It was late 70s. My uncle uh, was one of the owners, one of the thousand members of the New York Stock Exchange. And we were watching TV. I remember this very vid vividly. I was in his apartment on Fifth Avenue overlooking Central Park. And the news was talking about hyperinflation in South America, specifically Argentina at that point in time. And he said, uh, he asked me, he said, well, what's the problem with hyperinflation? And I said, well, people get wiped out. You know, their purchasing power gets wiped out. And he said, yes, that's right. Uh, and their savings get wiped out. And he said, yes, that's right. I, and then he asked me another very important question. He said, what else gets wiped out? And I didn't know. He, he eventually had to feed me the answer. The answer is debt gets wiped out. So people's on fixed income, their purchasing power gets wiped out, savings get wiped out, and debt gets wiped out. So it's a little bit like you're going onto the field to play a game. You've got your pads, you've got your helmet. Uh, you think you're going to play football. And then these other dudes out there with these kind of funny shoes that have blades on them and they're running circles around you. You think you're playing football, but everyone else is playing hockey and you're losing and you don't know why. And that's the inflation game. Everyone's thinking that they're playing this game, get a good job, save money, save up for retirement. Uh, invest in mutual mutual funds and retirement savings plans and 401ks and all of that sort of stuff. And that's the American dream or the Canadian dream as the case may be. Well, you're playing the wrong game. So the question is, how are you going to play the game to win an inflationary environment? So in an inflationary environment, 
let's imagine, I'll give you a very simple example. Let's imagine, and we'll keep the simple, the math simple. Imagine that you bought a house for a million bucks and you decided that you were going to finance it conventionally. You're going to put 200,000 down and you're going to borrow 800,000. So you've got an 80, 20 debt, um, uh, loan to value ratio and, um, you're, you, you have 200,000 in equity. Okay. Now inflation, let's say inflation's at 10%, which is not far from today's truth. So a year later, that property is going to price at a million one. And let's imagine that in that first year, you make no principal pay down, you're paying interest only on your debt. So you still have 800,000 in debt. Now, I'm not saying that property's worth a million one. I'm saying it's priced at a million one because the, really what's happened is the currency is devalued. But in dollars, which is our point of reference, it's now priced at a million one. So what's happened? Your, your loan to value ratio has now changed. Your equity is now $300,000 in next year's dollars, which is really $270,000 in last year's dollars. But what other investment can you go into that will give you something approaching 50% 50, 50 return in one year. And all, what have you done? All you've done is you play the inflation game by being on the winning side of that trade. So the key to winning in today's environment is to be in hard assets that have intrinsic value, where you have an effective hedge against inflation, lever it responsibly with debt so that the price gain goes to the equity side of the equation and the debt gets devalued. If you can get great financing terms, like a HUD loan in the US or a CMHC loan in Canada that's got a 35 or 40 or 50 year amortization. I mean, think about it. A 40 year HUD loan priced today at three and a quarter percent, rate locked for 40 years, fully amortized, non-recourse, assumable loan. That's a license to print money because that loan is gonna be so worth so much less in 20, 30 years, even 10 years at today's rate of inflation that all of that benefit goes to the equity side of the equation. It's not complicated. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's not complicated. Yeah, you know, it's a very powerful thing for you to outline for us how you can be on the winning side in an inflationary environment and being in hard assets is the way to do it. And using debt, as you said, responsibly can be a fantastic way for you to increase your net worth. And the folks who are holding the debt, they're the ones who are gonna be suffering a little bit because that debt isn't gonna be worth as much to them. So they're gonna to try to raise interest rates to recoup that. But if inflation continues to go up, it's not gonna matter. The government of Canada says our inflation rate right now is 7.9%. I don't know how they're calculating that, but if you look at the price of gas in the last year, it's gone up close to 80%. The price of housing in markets like Toronto has gone up at least 40%. And groceries are up 20% on average. So I don't know how they're calculating their inflation rate, but to me, I believe it's well into double digits. It's not as low as 7.9%. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. No, that's absolutely true. And every government does this. They have various metrics that they use to measure inflation. They have different baskets of goods that they put in that inflation measure. Now, the thing to remember is what they are calling inflation is not actually inflation. Um, what they're what they're saying, what they're doing is they're they're putting together a price index. Inflation is the inflation of the money supply. And when you have a growing money supply against a fixed, essentially a fixed size economy, you're essentially devaluing the currency. That's all you're doing because you're, you're basically playing in a fixed sandbox, but throwing more money at the problem. The rising prices are the symptom of inflation. It's kind of like when you take your temperature and the doctor says you have a fever. The fever is not inflation. The fever is a symptom. The, the root cause, the issue is, oh, you have the flu. And, and that's what you've got to focus on. And so um, when, you have, when you have people talking about inflation, it, it can be very easily manipulated. For ex I'll very, give you a very simple example. One of the, the metrics that the Bureau of Labor Statistics uses, it, they do the same thing in the UK, they do the same thing in Canada, is, and this is one of many different um, manipulations going go to inflation. They have this um, concept called substitution. So imagine for the moment that the price of steak goes up. 
you know, the, the, the tenderloin steak that you li- love to have on Friday nights, that, that's gone up and it's just too expensive. So the idea is that you're going to substitute for something cheaper. You might choose to have salmon that night or tilapia or something that's going to be cheaper. And so they simply substitute that you're going to, in your grocery bill, you're going to substitute for something cheaper. And they simply ignore the fact that the price of tenderloin steak went up. And, and they do this all over the place. There's all kinds of different um, techniques that are used. There's hedonics. There's all kinds of different things. I won't go into in all of those details, but they do manipulate the metric. And, and it's something they've done progressively over time. If you compare the inflation metric today as compared to how it was done in the 1970s, um, there's a, in the United States, there's a, um, a, a group called Shadow Stats. Uh, I believe his name is John Williams, uh, who does this. And, and what they do is they take the Bureau of Labor, they take all of the government statistics and simply reproduce the metrics for things like inflation, the way they would have been measured using the old methodologies in the 1970s and 80s. So yes, the government reports inflation today, but if you look at how they reported it back then, what they're calling 7.1, or in the case of the US right now, 7.9%, using the old metrics, it's more like 15. And it's simply because, uh, you know, each successive government has found a small micro adjustment to make to the metric that in and of itself has not made a big difference, but cumulatively over time just results in one giant lie, ultimately. I was about to say, basically, they're lying to us. There, yeah. And here's the other thing. It's yearly reminiscent of the old Roman emperors having the, um, the the Caesars go and take Roman coins and debasing them. You know, they'd shave off a little bit of the silver off of the coin and they try to pass that off as a, as, as a regular denarius, a regular, you know, unit of exchange, uh, a regular store of value. And, and the truth was that it wasn't. And when they did that, they messed with the economy. And that's what they're doing now. So, Victor, what's your advice for somebody who isn't currently invested in real estate or other hard assets? What can they do? What should they do? It doesn't have to be real estate itself. It can be other hard assets. I'm a big proponent of, I'm a proponent of investing in gold. Now, that doesn't mean buying gold certificates, I actually like to hold the metal itself because there's no counterparty. When you go buy a gold certificate, you're banking on the fact that your broker is not going to go bankrupt because all he's doing is he's selling you a certificate and registering an entry in a database that says you own so many ounces of gold. But if he goes bust, all you have is a paper claim against a a record in in an account. So there's some counterparty risk there. It's not zero. Whereas when you hold the physical gold itself, there's no counterparty. I like to eliminate counterparty risk because we don't know the chain of dependencies that exist in our economy. We talk about supply chain issues. Well, those same long chain domino effect of issues exist in the financial system as well, where what appears as an asset on one person's balance sheet is a liability on someone else's. If one of those liabilities goes bad, you don't know, you can't see from your vantage point that chain of events that will cascade through the entire financial system and who's ultimately going to be affected. You might remember, um, you know, a little over a decade ago when there was a period of time when Greece was in jeopardy of defaulting on their sovereign debt and it was going to take down some banks in France because they had about 3% exposure to Greek sovereign debt. Well, when when your fractional reserve is um, uh, 3%, uh, (laughs) that's enough to bankrupt your bank. And, th- and that's the situation they were they were in. So I, I'm a proponent of holding the physical asset. I think in today's environment, there are some very good investment opportunities, um, simply because they're, look, what is, when you invest, these are all active businesses. There's no such thing as a passive business, but you can invest passively in an active business. So the question is, is this business solving a real problem that people have? Is it an acute problem? Is it something that really is, you know, people are going to spend money to solve? Like, for example, right now in Canada, we have an acute shortage of housing. The government has an idea that, yeah, there's too many foreign investors buying up Canada. That's not the case. It's just not even close. But it sells, it's popular. And it, it, it maybe wins votes if you say, yeah, it's all those foreign investors. That's why housing so expensive in Canada. Um, 
it's a it's a it's a small fraction of single digit percentages and 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 it's not enough to move the needle you know they even talk about well there's too many vacant properties i can tell you in this because i've been part of the discussion with the city of ottawa where i live that there's about 250 vacant properties in ottawa today that represents a little under a week of inventory so even if all of those vacant properties were fully occupied today it's about a week worth of inventory again that's not going to move the needle so, but it make it it makes it popular, at least with the with the voting public, that the government scene is doing something when in fact they're really doing very little, which is unfortunate because the real systemic issues uh, with respect to housing stem from the fact that uh, it doesn't matter who owns the property. The co- when when the city of Toronto is charging eighty four thousand dollars in development charges to add a single single family home to the infrastructure in Toronto, that makes that's a big number. We do a lot of construction for eighty four grand, but but that's the number. And so and and then even to to do that, you're you're talking months and months, and in some cases years, just to get that approved. So you have hundreds of thousands of people clamoring to enter our nation as immigrants, and we're only producing half of the housing to meet the demand. Well, it's no surprise that in a supply demand environment that that prices are going up. It's not rocket science. It's you not focus on the supply side. Seventy percent of immigrants coming to Canada end up in the GTA. Seven zero. That's insane. Uh, you know the incentives for people to go elsewhere are really non-existent. They say, "Yeah, you should go somewhere other than Toronto," but Toronto's where a lot of the action is for new immigrant communities. That's where a lot of them end up being. Like I, I myself, am looking at this. I own um, a, a condo townhouse in Toronto in a trendy neighborhood in the beach. And it's wonderful, but, you know, it's 1,200 square feet. I think one of my neighbors just sold their unit for $1.4 million. That's an insane number. Victor, that's over $1,000 a square foot. Yeah. Like, what? A townhouse? A townhouse? Are you kidding me? Yeah, when you can build that townhouse for $250 a square foot in terms of hard cost. But when you add all of those other costs, the land costs... The development charges, the soft costs, all of those things together, it's very difficult to make the numbers work, especially in the Toronto area right now at anything under 750 bucks a square foot. I, it's I'll crazy. T- I'll, I'll tell you for myself, uh, my, my goal and my vision is uh, to be able to sell my high-priced Toronto real estate at some point, find a place uh, about an hour or so out of the city, uh, where the rules are a little less insane, <laughs> buy myself some property there and probably be able to double or triple the size of the house I get for the, for the same amount of money that I paid in Toronto and not have to deal with uh, left-wing bureaucrats who don't really understand that it's their uh, perfidy and stupidity that's causing some of the problems that people are having, not being able to have things like housing and, and massively contributing to inflation because the government doesn't seem to really understand, or if they do understand, they don't seem to care that what they're doing is actually hurting people, hurting their ability to make a living, then that's not good. Let's talk a little bit about about the land value multiplier, because a lot of people might intuitively know this, but when I share this with you, it'll, it'll become crystal clear. The value of land is determined by what you can do with it. So, for example, if you start at the base level, um, agricultural land is kind of the first useful land. Below that, there's conservation land or environmentally protected land that, at least in terms of monetary value, is almost worthless because you can't do anything with it. So you can take it, you can donate it to conservation, but in terms of it having intrinsic monetary value, conservation land, that's pretty close to zero. Then you go to agricultural land, that's anywhere from three to $4,000 an acre. You rent it out to a farmer, you're going to pay your property taxes, and that's about it. You're not going to make a profit on that land. Now, if you're growing some higher value crop like weed, maybe you might get 10 grand an acre, but it, you're in that range. As soon as you can develop that land and do something with it, now it's worth more. If you can put a residential subdivision on it, just papered without it and putting the, in the infrastructure, but as long as it's entitled, in most places around Canada, around the United States, you're looking at at least... 200,000 an acre. You're looking at about 50,000 a lot, assuming a density of four units per acre. That's about where things things net out. You keep going up the density, 
And think about in the core of Toronto, you're now talking millions per acre. So what other thing, what other asset can you find where the exact same thing, dirt, has almost a factor of a thousand or more multiplier in value? At one end of the spectrum, 10 grand an acre, another end of the spectrum, millions per acre, and it's all it's tied to is what you're allowed to do with it. So the value in land is completely tied to entitlement, completely tied to entitlement. And as soon as you understand that and you start to look at the world through that lens, you see it very differently. You don't look at the building that's there. You don't say, oh, that's a, a crappy 1950s construction house. You look at the land and you look at entitlements and you look at what can I do with it. That's the, Then you start to see the world a little bit differently. That makes sense. Although uh, I think about it from the perspective of uh, a man with some common sense, agricultural land should be far more valuable than any type of land because that's what grows food. And without food, we're toast, you know, in, in this day and age. But that's not what it is. I mean, as you say, agricultural land is worth very little compared to residential land. But if we come into a situation where what, you know, Joe Biden said comes to pass, where there's a food shortage in North America, I got to believe that the value of agricultural land is going to go through the roof. What what Joe Biden's talking about is something different, and he's absolutely right. In fact, I put a podcast out about this. Um, it went live today on this very issue. The issue has to do with the fact, and it, you know, a lot of people are pointing to the conflict in the Ukraine, where you know, between Russia and the Ukraine, there, there's a significant percentage of the world's wheat. In fact, the World Food Program, a large percentage of their wheat comes from. Ukraine. And those crops are going to absolutely be decimated this year. But that's not the biggest issue. The biggest issue is actually fertilizer. So what goes into fertilizer? There's basically three chemicals and a bunch of energy. Most fertilizer plants are located next to natural gas facilities where you have cheap, abundant gas. But today, the price of natural gas in most parts of the world is off the charts. Today, Russia and Belarus. Okay, so let's talk about one of the ingredients, potash. So there's three ingredients in fertilizers, nitrogen, potassium, and uh, phosphorus. Those three, those three. Potassium comes from potash. Canada is the largest producer. We produce about 15 million metric tons a year. Number two, in, uh, no, 14 million metric tons a year. Belarus and Russia produce together, each of them individually about seven and a half million metric tons, together about 15 million metric tons. The next country after that is China at five million then Germany at 3 million, and it drops from there, Israel, Jordan, and so on, down into very, very small quantities. So now remove Russia and Belarus from production of potash and supply of fertilizer to countries like Brazil. Brazil's going to take their last shipment of fertilizer on May the 6th from Russia. 80% of their fertilizer supply comes from Russia today. So who's going to replace their supply of fertilizer? The entire Brazilian agriculture that is relying on synthetic, uh, synthetic fertilizer is essentially being held hostage today to the conflict in the Ukraine. And it has everything to do with fertilizer. That's where we're going to see food security issues because you start removing synthetic fertilizer and now yields drop by 60, 70%. And that's a big deal. Isn't that going to affect the price of agricultural land? So the people that do have agricultural land are going to find that their holdings are more valuable because you know there's less food and, and food's going it's, to be it's not a land issue it's not a land issue it's a yield issue i understand it's a yield issue but that does if you own land and you're one of the few people that's producing food and there's less food around your food's going to be more valuable and then the land's going to be more valuable that's producing that food right yeah i i see where you're going with that and and there may be an element of truth to that I think what we need to figure out is because the food shortages are going to happen this year. So, you know, what acreage that we're currently, um, you know, planting corn for ethanol to go into gasoline tanks, how much of that acreage should be repurposed for food production? I think that's something very important to look at. There's a few things like that that certainly can be done here in the West that we haven't really even begun to talk about. Uh, but it's going to be a very, a very real issue. By Q4, we will see food insecurity. We will see food prices way above we even our highest imagination of what we're thinking about today. And we will also see social unrest related to food insecurity. Do you think that social unrest is going to come to places like Canada? 
We're already seeing it in South America. Earlier this week, uh, the uh, in in Lima, in Peru, and in one of the coastal cities, there have been protests over price inflation for food and inflation on fertilizer. And they actually had curfews for several days over this past week, where the Peruvian prime minister had to essentially implement a lockdown to put a stop to these protests. And we're just getting started. So if that happens in Canada, the protests that we saw in Ottawa back in January and February are going to look like a walk in the park, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, think about it. How many days? Now, you know, we don't really worry in Canada. We've never had to worry about food security. But how many days would you need to go hungry before you're taking action? Two? Three? Not five. Oh, not five. You're nine meals away. Yeah. That's yeah. it. And that's pretty universal, pretty much anywhere in the world. So think about what kind of supply chain disruption, what kind of fertilizer disruption would need to happen to create a nine meal problem for somebody somewhere in the world. It's pretty fragile. Yeah, it really is. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm stocking up on, on uh, non-perishable foods myself. Recommend that people do stock up on non-perishable foods. And uh, it's my hope and belief that here in Canada, we're going to be able to produce a lot of our food ourselves. So we may be having some issues importing food, but I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity for us to make food. We do have access to fertilizer here in Canada, thank God. And we've got a lot of farmland, but it still could potentially be an issue. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're living in, in crazy uncertain times. So Victor, we like to end up each podcast by asking you to give our, our listeners your top three pieces of advice, your top three expert action steps. Given the environment we're in right now, I'd like you to kind of address things people can do to thrive in these times and protect themselves from issues like inflation and food insecurity. So what do you say? I would say focus on solving problems that really exist. So today my focus is on not necessarily uh, developing the most expensive real estate, but although we do have a few luxury properties we're developing, vast majority are really aimed more centrally at that workforce housing segment, because that's where the need is the most acute. Um, I would focus, you know, a lot of people tend to think about, uh, you know, what resources do they need? What am I missing in order to participate in this? And they often say, well, I got to read a book, or I got to take a course or something like that. And there's a lot of people out there selling that promise saying, I'll just take this course and you're all set. I'm, I'm, it's unfortunate that that's not enough. It's about, a, it's one of three things that you need. The second thing you, you'll run into is you'll run into the, the mindset folks that say, well, yeah, you've got to have that knowledge, but you've got to go get yourself some mindset. That's your problem. You don't have the right mindset. And that's important too. You've got those folks that need the emotional fortitude to to survive what will be difficult times. That's important too. But unfortunately, that's not the ticket either. What is the ticket, and this is the game changer that most people neglect, is you got to get yourself in the right environment. And it's who you're connected with. If you want to be, and you've said it many times, uh, Jim Rohn said it, who you hang out with is who you become. Yeah. And that's, that is the ticket. So surround yourself with people that are doing great things, that are doing things that are game changing, that are moving the needle, and you become immersed in that environment. And now you're able to do that as well. But it's the key is to be immersed in that environment. Those are three really excellent pieces of advice. Just given what we're dealing with in the world today, I think they matter more than ever. You know, you got to learn the right things. You, you, you've got to have the right mindset and you've got to be around the right people in the right environments. And hey, we've got this fantastic event coming up May 13th, 14th in Toronto. It's the first live event that we've had since before the pandemic. We've got some incredible uh, speakers there, like the founder of 1-800-GOT-JUNK. We've got Jean Taillon, who has scaled... Uh, for companies, including some tech companies by 150 to 500 million. And we've got uh, legendary singer Dan Hill that's going to be there. Branding expert Raymond Aaron's going to be there. It's, it's all going to be fun and good stuff. So that's a great environment to be in. It's a great place to learn some things. It's a great place to get some 
exceptional mindset training to help move you forward. And Victor, I know you're a big believer in this. You could meet someone at a live event that could help you add 50, 100,000, 200,000, even a million dollars to your business income this year. That's possible when you're around the right people in the right place. So 100%. Uh, yeah. Awesome. So uh, listener, Victor Minash is the real deal. If you want to find out more about him, we're going to put his website down in the show notes. His podcast is called The Real Estate Espresso Podcast. I highly recommend that you check it out. His book, Magnetic Capital, is a book that's fantastic. I highly recommend that you read that book. Start applying some of the things he talks about to raising money for your ventures. It's not just for real estate. It helps you raise money for anything that you do. And uh, I got to tell you, Victor Menashe is somebody that I have a ton of respect for. Always enjoy our conversations. Always learn ton, a ton from them. Uh, Victor, thanks so much for coming on the show, brother. Thank you, Nikki. It was a lot of fun to have you on. And that wraps up another exciting episode of the podcast, The Thought Leader Revolution. To find out more about today's amazing guest, the one and only Victor Menashe, check out the show notes at thethoughtleaderrevolution.com or go to wherever you happen to listen to this uh, podcast episode, be it Spotify, Stitcher, uh, Apple iTunes, or Audible or Google Play. And until next time, goodbye. This episode has been brought to you by eCircleAcademy.com, the proven system to add six to seven figures a year to your thought leader practice.